Ignatius ignored his mother's pounding on his door and crying in the hall about the fifty cents in wages that he had brought home for the day's work. Sweeping the big chief tablets, yo-yo, and rubber glove from his desk, he opened the journal and began to write. Dear reader, the perverted, and I suspect quite dangerous, mind of Clyde has devised still another means of belittling my rather invincible being. At first, I thought that I might have found a surrogate father in the Tsar of Sausage, the mogul of meat. Now, he has relegated me to working in the French Quarter, an area which houses every vice that man has ever conceived in his wildest aberrations, including, I would imagine, several modern variants made possible through the wonders of science. Clearly, an area like the French Quarter is not the proper environment for a clean-living, chaste, prudent, an impressionable young working boy. Did Edison, Ford, and Rockefeller have to struggle against such odds? Clyde's fiendish mind has not stopped at so simple an abasement, however. Because I am allegedly handling what Clyde calls the tourist trade, I have been caparisoned in a costume of sorts. About my cap, I tied the red sateen pirate scarf. I screwed the one golden earring, a large novelty store hoop of an earring, onto my left earlobe. I affixed the black plastic cutlass to the side of my white vendor's smock with a safety pin. Hardly an impressive pirate, you will say. However, when I studied myself in the mirror, I was forced to admit that I appeared rather fetching in a dramatic way. Suspendedly, Lance, your besieged working boy. Gus Levy was a nice guy. He was also a regular fella. He had friends among promoters and trainers and coaches and managers across the country. At any arena or stadium or track, Gus Levy could count on knowing at least one person connected with the place. Levy's Lodge was where he went between seasons. He had no friends there. At Christmas, the only sign of the season at Levy's Lodge, the only barometer of Yuletide spirit, was the appearance of his daughters, who descended upon him from college with demands for additional money coupled with threats to disavow his paternity forever if he continued to mistreat their mother. Mrs. Levy had stretched Miss Trixie across his favorite couch, the yellow nylon one, and was rubbing skin cream into the old woman's face. Now and then, Miss Trixie's tongue would flap out and sample a bit of cream from her upper lip. I'm getting nauseous from watching that, Mr. Levy said. Can't you take her outside? It's a nice day. She likes this couch, Mrs. Levy answered. Let her have some enjoyment. Why don't you go outside and wax your sports car? Silence! Miss Trixie snarled with the stupendous false teeth that Mrs. Levy had just bought her. Listen to that, Mr. Levy said. She's really running this place. So she's asserting herself. Does that bother you? The teeth have given her a little self-confidence. I'm beginning to understand why she's so insecure. I found out that Gonzalez ignores her all day, makes her feel unwanted in about a hundred different ways. Subconsciously, she hates Levy Pants. I'm a very attractive woman, Miss Trixie mumbled in her sleep. Listen to that, Mrs. Levy cried happily. And you want to throw her out in the snow? I'm just getting through to her. She's like a symbol of everything you haven't done. Suddenly, Miss Trixie leaped up, snarling. Where's my eyeshade? Where am I? Take your hands off me. Darling, Mrs. Levy began, but Miss Trixie had fallen asleep on her side, her cream face smearing the couch. You better take those teeth out of her mouth before she bites off her tongue. Then she'll really be stuck. Speaking of tongue, you should have heard all she told me about Gloria this morning. Mrs. Levy made a gesture that indicated acceptance of injustice and tragedy. Gloria was the soul of kindness. The first person in years who took an interest in Miss Trixie. Then, out of the blue, you walk in and kick Gloria out of her life. I think it's given her a very bad trauma. The girls would love to know about Gloria. They'd ask you some questions, believe me. Quiet! Miss Trixie snarled. Ignatius was beginning to feel worse and worse. His valve seemed to be glued. No amount of bouncing was opening it. The physical cause for this health decline was, he knew, the too strenuous consuming of paradise products. But there were other subtler reasons. His mother was becoming increasingly bold and overtly antagonistic. It was becoming impossible to control her. Perhaps she had joined some fringe group of the far right wing that was making her belligerent and hostile. At any rate, she certainly had been carrying on a witch hunt in the kitchen recently, 
asking him all sorts of questions concerning his political philosophy, which was strange. His mother had always been notably apolitical, voting only for candidates who seemed to have been kind to their mothers. By night, he was plagued by dreams, and by day, by the impossible route that Mr. Clyde had given him. When and how would this vicious cycle end? He had read in the morning paper that a ladies' art guild was having a hanging of its paintings in Pirate's Alley. Imagining that the paintings would be offensive enough to interest him for a while, he pushed his wagon up onto the flagstones of the alley toward the artwork dangling from the iron pickets of the fence behind the cathedral. The alley was filled with well-dressed ladies in large hats, and Ignatius pointed the prow of the wagon into the throng and pushed forward. Hot dogs, ladies? Ignatius asked pleasantly. He belched violently during the silence that followed, grabbed the handle of his cart and pushed off. Ignatius squatted uncomfortably on the side steps of the cathedral. His recently increased weight and the bloating caused by the inoperative valve made any position other than standing or lying down somewhat awkward. Removing his boots, he began to inspect his great slabs of feet. Oh, dear! A voice said above Ignatius, What am I seeing? I come out to see this dreadful tacky art exhibit, and what do I find as exhibit number one? Ignatius looked up and saw the young man who had bought his mother's hat in the night of joy. What in God's name are you doing in that bizarre outfit? You look like Charles Lawton in drag as the Queen of the Gypsies. What are you supposed to be? Move along, you coxcomb. Ignatius belched, the gassy erectations echoing between the walls of the alley. Ignatius glared at the young man's tawny velvet jacket and mauve cashmere sweater and the wave of blonde hair that fell over the forehead of his sharp, glittering face. Get away from me before I strike you down. Oh, my goodness! The young man laughed in short, merry, childish breath. Oh, you really are insane, aren't you? Don't talk to me, you degenerate. Go play with your little friends. I'm certain that the quarter is crawling with them. And if you want a costume like this, then buy one, Ignatius said. Let me alone. I know that something like that couldn't be bought anywhere. Oh, but it would bring the house down at a party. I suspect the parties you attend must be true visions of the apocalypse. I knew that our society was coming to this. In a few years, you and your friends will probably take over the country. Oh, we're planning to, the young man said with a bright smile. We have connections in the highest places. You'd be surprised. Why don't you run along and partake in some dubious recreation that appeals to you? Ignatius belched. Look, there's a sailor drifting along Short Street. He looks rather lonely. The young man glanced down to the end of the alley. Oh, him, he said. That's only Timmy. Timmy? Ignatius asked angrily. Do you know him? Of course, the young man said in a voice heavy with boredom. He's one of my dearest, oldest friends. He's not a sailor at all. The young man and the sailor waved at each other familiarly and the sailor drifted out of sight around the front of the cathedral. Following a few steps behind the sailor, Patrolman Mancuso appeared at the end of Pirate's Alley, wearing a beret and goatee. Oh! The young man shrieked gaily, watching Patrolman Mancuso stalking the sailor. It's that marvelous policeman! Don't they know that everyone in the quarter knows who he is? Do you know him too? Ignatius asked guardedly. He's a very dangerous man. Everyone knows him. Thank goodness he's back again. We were beginning to wonder what had happened to him. We love him dearly. Oh, I simply wait to see what new disguise they put on him. You should have seen him a few weeks ago before he disappeared. He was just too much in that cowboy outfit. The young man exploded in wild laughter. He's thoroughly evil, Ignatius observed. Then he said, I wonder how many of our military are simply people like your friend, disguised tarts. Who knows? I wish they all were. Of course, Ignatius said in a thoughtful, serious voice. This could be a worldwide deception. The red sateen scarf rode up and down. The next war could turn out to be one massive orgy. Good grief. How many of the military leaders of the world may simply be deranged old sodomites acting out some fake fantasy role? Actually, this might be quite beneficial to the world. It could mean an end to war forever. This could be the key to lasting peace. It certainly could, the young man said pleasantly. Peace at any price. Two nerve ends in Ignatius's mind met and formed an immediate association. Perhaps he had found a means of assaulting the effrontery of M. Minkoff. Perhaps 
You are the hope for the future, Ignatius said, dramatically pounding one paw into the other. Oh, what a fun day this has been. You're a gypsy. Timmy's a sailor. The marvelous policeman's an artist, the young man sighed. It's just like Mardi Gras, and I feel so left out. I think I'll go home and throw something on. Wait, just a moment, Ignatius said. He couldn't permit this opportunity to slip through his swollen fingers. Have you people considered forming a political party and running a candidate? Politics? Oh, maid of Orleans, how dreary. This is very important, Ignatius shouted worriedly. He would show Myrna how to inject sex into politics. You must start a party organization. Plans must be made. Oh, please, the young man sighed. All this man's talk is making my mind real. I'm afraid I'll have to be running along. It's costume time. No! Ignatius grabbed the lapel of the young man's jacket. There must be a large organizational meeting to kick off the campaign. Wouldn't that be something like a party? We'll have it next week at my house. I'll work myself to exhaustion, the young man said gaily. Ward meetings, voter registration, pamphlets, committees. We'll start the kickoff rally around eight-ish. I'm on St. Peter's Street, the yellow stucco building just off Royal. You can't miss it. Here's my card. Oh, my God. Ignatius mumbled. You can't possibly be named Dorian Green. Yes. Isn't that wild? Dorian asked languidly. It was all a matter of storage. From almost one to three every afternoon, George was stuck with the packages. By three o'clock, he was so tired from the marathon of strolling that he hardly had the enthusiasm to negotiate his day's business. And in two hours of being carried, the wrapping on the packages got damp and started to break. Why had that undercover agent tried to arrest him in the restroom? He hadn't done a thing. That agent must have had some sort of detective ESP. But back to the matter of storage. It had been before him all the time, and he just hadn't realized it. He could have kicked himself in the shins with the stiletto toes of his flamenco boots. He saw a nice, roomy, weather-tight metal compartment, a mobile safety deposit box that no undercover agent, however crafty, would think of opening, a safe vault operated by the biggest patsy in the world, the bun compartment in that oddball vendor's wagon. Mrs. Levy helped the renovated Miss Trixie up the steps and open the door. This is Levy Pants, Miss Trixie snarled. I, I thought I was retired. The massive teeth snapped like a bear trap. You people have tricked me. Listen to the fire in her voice, Mrs. Levy said. So vigorous, it's unbelievable. She's back? Mr. Gonzalez cried heartbrokenly. Can you believe your eyes, Mrs. Levy asked him. Mr. Gonzalez was forced to look at Miss Trixie, whose eyes were weak pools edged with blue shadow. Her lips had been extended in an orange line that almost reached her nostrils. Near the earrings, a few gray wisps of hair escaped from beneath the black wig, which was slightly awry. The short skirt revealed withered, bowed legs and small feet that made the pumps look like snowshoes. Whole days of napping under a sunlamp had baked Miss Trixie to a golden brown. She certainly looks fit, Mr. Gonzalez said. His voice was false as he smiled a broken smile. You've done her a wonderful service, Mrs. Levy. Ah, I'm a very attractive woman, Miss Trixie babbled. Mr. Gonzalez laughed nervously. I want you to make her feel wanted, Gonzalez. This woman still has a sharp mind. Give her work that will exercise these faculties of hers. Give her more authority. She desperately needs an active role in the business. All right, you had your fun. Let's go, Mr. Levy said to his wife. Come on, I'm getting depressed. Just a moment, Mr. Gonzalez said. I have some mail for you. He handed Mr. Levy a sheaf of mail. There's a letter in there from Abelman. Mr. Levy looked at the envelope, opened it, and found a letter on which some attachment had been stapled. Dear Gus Levy, we were shocked and grievously injured to receive the attached letter. We have been a faithful outlet for your merchandise for 30 years and have heretofore always had the warmest affectionate feeling for your firm. Maybe you remember the wreath we sent when your father died for which we spared no expense. This will be very short. After many nights without sleep, we have given the original letter to our lawyer who is instigating a libel suit for $500,000. This may do a little to compensate for our hurt feelings. Get a lawyer. We will see you in court like gentlemen. No more threats, please. Very best wishes, I, Abelman, manager Abelman's dry goods. Mr. Levy turned cold as he flipped the page and read the copy of the letter to Abelman's. It was incredible. 
Who would go to the trouble of writing things like that? Mr. I. Abelman, Mongoloid Esquire? You may feel the sting of the lash across your pitiful shoulders. Worst of all, the Gus Levy signature looked fairly authentic. Who wrote this? Mr. Levy demanded, giving the letter to Mr. Gonzalez. Oh, my goodness, Mr. Gonzalez squeezed. This is horrible. It's the first time I've seen that letter. You write the correspondence around here. I didn't write that. His lips were quivering. I wouldn't do something like that to Levy Pence. No, I know you wouldn't. Mr. Levy tried to think. Somebody really had it in for us. Gonzalez, what was the name of that big hook you had working in here, the big fat one with the green cap? Mr. Ignatius Riley. He handled the letter to go out. Get me this Riley's phone number. Mr. Levy dialed the number. A woman who sounded slightly intoxicated answered and told him that Mr. Riley wouldn't be home until late in the afternoon. Then she started crying, and Mr. Levy got depressed, thanked her, and hung up. Well, he's not home, Mr. Levy told the audience in the office. I'll call him tonight from the coast. There's nothing to worry about. They can't sue me for a half a million for a letter I didn't write. In the sports car, as they drove through the salt marshes that led back to the coast, Mrs. Levy, pulling her blowing fur up closer around her neck, said, I'm establishing a foundation. It will be called the Leon Levy Foundation in honor of your father. I have to do something to honor your father's name for all that you haven't done to honor it. The awards will commemorate the memory of that great man. George had set up his stakeout across from the Paradise Vendors Incorporated garage. At noon, George had left his outpost and gone down to the quarter to get the packages from Miss Lee. Now he was wondering whether the vendor was going to show. George had decided to try to be nice to him, to hand him a few dollars right away. Hot dog vendors must be poor. He'd, he'd appreciate a few bucks. This vendor was a perfect front man. Ignatius did not notice that for quite some time his cart had been traveling in a straight and unswerving line. Stopping, he saw that one of the bicycle tires had lodged in the groove of a streetcar track. He tried to bump the cart out of the groove. It was too heavy to be easily bounced. George saw his opportunity. He ran over to Ignatius and said cheerfully, Come on, Prof, let's you and me get this off the street. Oh, my God, Ignatius thundered, my pubescent nemesis. What a promising day this appears to be. Get away, you depraved urchin. You grab that and I'll get this one. The cart bounced back onto its two bicycle tires, the contents of the tin bun rattling against its sides. Okay, there you go. Glad I could help you out. George grabbed one of Ignatius's paws and stuck two dollars in it. Money? Ignatius asked happily. Thank God! He quickly pocketed the two bills. While Ignatius was slamming doors and plunging his paws down into the well, George said, Now, I helped you out. Maybe you could do the same for me. Perhaps, Ignatius said disinterestedly, biting into the hot dog. You see these? George indicated the brown paper packages he was carrying under his arms. These are school supplies. Now, this is the problem. I got to pick them up from the distributor at lunchtime, but I can't deliver them to the schools until after school's closed. So I got to carry them around for almost two hours. You understand? What I'm looking for is a place to put these things in the afternoon. Now, I could meet you someplace about one and put them in your bun compartment and come get them out sometime before three. How bogus, Ignatius Belch. Do you seriously expect me to believe you delivering school supplies after the schools are closed? I'll pay you a couple of bucks every day. You will? Ignatius asked with interest. Well, you will have to pay me a week's rent in advance. I don't deal in small sums. George opened his wallet and gave Ignatius eight dollars. Ignatius happily pocketed the new bills and ripped one of the packages from George's arm, saying, I must see what it is that I'm storing. You're probably selling goofballs to infants. Hey, George shouted, I can't deliver the stuff if it's open. Too bad for you. Ignatius fended off the boy and tore off the brown wrapping. He saw a stack of what looked like postcards. What are these? Visual aids for civics? Or some other equally stultifying high school subject? Give me that, you nut. Oh, my God! Ignatius stared at what he saw. Once in high school, someone had shown him a pornographic photograph, and he had collapsed against a water cooler, injuring his ear. This photograph was far superior. A nude woman was sitting on the edge of a desk next to a globe of the world. The suggested onanism with the piece of chalk intrigued Ignatius. 
Her face was hidden behind a large book. While George evaded indifferent slaps from the unoccupied paw, Ignatius scrutinized the title on the cover of the book, The Consolation of Philosophy. Do I believe what I'm seeing? What brilliance! What taste! Good grief! Give that back, George pleaded. This one is mine, Ignatius gloated, pocketing the top card. He handed the torn package back to George and looked at the piece of torn wrapping between his fingers. There was an address on it. He pocketed that, too. Where in the world did you get these? Who is this brilliant woman? None of your business. Oh, I see. A secret operation. Ignatius thought of the address on the piece of paper. He would do his own investigating. Some destitute woman intellectual was doing anything for a dollar. It could be that she was in the same situation as the working boy, a seer and philosopher cast into a hostile century by forces beyond her control. Ignatius must meet her. She might have some new and valuable insights. Well, in spite of my misgivings, I shall make my card available to you. However, you must watch the cart this afternoon. I have a rather urgent appointment. Hey, what is this? How long are you going to be? That's enough from you, you gutter snipe. Encouraging the degeneration of some noble woman scholar, Ignatius barked. You should be kissing the helm of my uniform in gratitude for my not advising Sherlock Mancuso of your evil goods. Meet me at the RKO Orpheum in two hours. As the film ended, Ignatius climbed over the four empty popcorn boxes that had accumulated before his seat during the movie. His emotions were spent. Gasping, he staggered up the aisle and out into the sunlight street. There by the cab standing at the Roosevelt Hotel, George was keeping a surly watch over the wagon. Jesus, he sneered. I thought you was never coming out of there. What kind of appointment you had? You just went to see a movie. Please? Ignatius sighed. I've just been through trauma. Run along. I'll meet you at one shop tomorrow at Canal and Royal. Ignatius rolled down into the quarter and for a wild and very fleeting moment pondered an affair. How Myrna would gnaw at her espresso cup rim in envy. He would describe every lush moment with this scholarly woman. With her background and worldview, he would take a very stoic and fatalistic view of whatever sexual gaucheries and blunders he committed. She would be understanding. Be kind, Ignatius would sigh to her. Myrna probably attacked sex with the vehemence and seriousness that she brought to social protest. How anguished she would be when Ignatius described his tender pleasures. Ignatius found the address and said, Oh, my God! The poor woman is in the hand of fiends! He studied the facade of the Night of Joy and lumbered up to the poster in the glass case. He read, Roberta E. Lee presents Harlot O'Hara, the Virgin New York Belle, and Pet. Who was Harlot O'Hara? Even more important, what kind of pet? Ignatius was intrigued. Afraid of attracting the wrath of the Nazi proprietress, he sat down uncomfortably on the curb and decided to wait. Lana Lee was watching Darlene and the bird. They were almost ready to open. The act was pretty good in its own way. George was really bringing in the money with the new merchandise. Things were looking good, too. Jones seemed to be broken in at last. Lana pushed the door open and hollered out into the street. Hey, you, get off my curb, you character. Let me assure you that I did not choose to collapse here before your gas chamber of a den. I did not return here of my own volition. My feet have simply ceased to function. I am paralyzed. Go get paralyzed down the block. All I need is you hanging around here again to ruin my investment. You look like a queer with that earring. People will think this is a gay bar. Now go on. Jones, I'll give you two seconds to come out here before I get you picked up on a vagrancy a rap along with this character. I'm getting fed up with smart asses in general. Woo-wee, Jones said when he looked out the door. The green cap mother... In person, live. Hustle him off, Lana said to Jones. Get out your razor and slash me, Ignatius said as Lana went in. Throw lie in my face, stab me. You wouldn't realize, of course, that it was my interest in civil rights which led to my becoming a crippled vendor of francs. I lost a particularly successful position because of my stand on the racial question. My broken feet are the indirect result of my sensitive social conscience. Leave it, pant. Kick your ass out for trying to get all them quote colored people thrown in jail, huh? How do you know about that? Ignatius asked guardedly. Were you involved in that particularly abortive coup? No. 
I hears people talking around. How come a white cat like you talking so good selling weenies? I have a very pleasant occupation, Ignatius answered icily. Outer work, no supervision. The only pressure is on the feet. If I go to college, I wouldn't be dragging no meat wagon around selling people a lot of garbage and shit. I really don't have time to discuss the errors of your value judgments. However, I would like some information from you. Do you, by any chance, have a woman in that den who is given to reading? Jones wondered what this was all about. He said, Woo, you want to see her? You come around some night, see her dancing with her pet. Bothius plus a pet? Ignatius mumbled. What a discovery. She'll be open in a couple, three days, man. You ought to get your ass down here. This is the finest act I ever seen. Woo! Good heavens. Some incisive commentary which no one in her audiences would fully comprehend. He must see Harlot. They must communicate. There's one thing I would like to know, sir, Ignatius said. Is the Nazi proprietress of this cesspool around here every night? Who? Miss Lee? No. Jones smiled at himself. The sabotage was working too perfectly. The fat mother really wanted to come to the night of joy. She say, Harlow O'Hara, so perfect, she's so fine. She don't have to be coming around at night to supervise. She say, just as soon as Harlow be opening, she leave him for a vacation in California. Woo, woo. What luck, Ignatius slobbered. Well, I shall be here to see Miss O'Hara's act. Ignatius gloated at Jones conspiratorially. What a brilliant day. The signs from Fortuna were more than promising. A surprised Mr. Clyde received cheery greetings and ten dollars from Vendor Riley, and Ignatius, his smock filled with bills from the waif and the mogul of Frankfurters, billowed onto the trolley with a glad heart. He entered the house and found his mother talking quietly on the telephone. I've been thinking about what you said, Mrs. Riley was whispering into the phone. Maybe it ain't such a bad idea after all, babe. You know what I mean? Of course it ain't, Santa answered. Them people at Charity can let Ignatius take him a little rest. Claude ain't gonna want no Ignatius around, sweetheart. What in the world are you babbling about, Ignatius thundered in the hall. Christ, Santa said. It sound like that Ignatius come in. Well, listen, sweetheart. Once Claude gets married, he'll stop thinking about them communists. His mind isn't occupied is what's wrong with him. You give him some loving. Listen, Santa said. You better ring up the Charity, honey. Santa guffawed in a voice huskier than usual and hung up. How much money you brought in today? A quarter? Mrs. Riley screamed. She leaped up and stuck her hand into one of the pockets of the smock and pulled out the brilliant photograph. Ignatius! Give that to me, Ignatius thundered. How dare you besmirch that magnificent image with your vintner's hands? Mrs. Riley peeked at the photograph again and then closed her eyes. A tear crept out from beneath her closed eyelids. I knew when you started selling them weenies, you was going to be hanging around with people like this. What do you mean, people like this? Ignatius asked angrily, pocketing the photograph. This is a brilliant, misused woman. Speak of her with respect and reverence. I don't want to speak at all. Mrs. Riley sniffed, her lid still sealed. Go sit in your room and write some more of your foolishness. The telephone rang. That must be that Mr. Levy. He already rang up here twice today. Well, I certainly don't want to speak with him. Ignatius thundered. He picked up the telephone and in an assumed voice, rich with Mayfair accents, said, Yes? Mr. Riley, a man asked. Mr. Riley is not here. This is Gus Levy. Terribly sorry, Ignatius enunciated. Mr. Riley was called out of town this afternoon on rather crucial business. Actually, he's at the state mental hospital in Mandeville. Since being so viciously dismissed by your concern... He has had to commute back and forth regularly from Mandeville. His ego is badly bruised. You may yet receive his psychiatrist's bills. They are rather staggering. He cracked up violently and totally. We had something of a time with him here. The first time that he went to Mandeville, he had to be transported in an armored car. As you know, his physique is rather grand. This afternoon, however... He left in a state patrol ambulance. Ignatius slammed the telephone down, pressed a quarter into the palm of his still sniffling blinded mother, and waddled to his room. All signs were pointing upward. His wheel was revolving skyward. There'd been a flurry of excitement. The wild blowing of the postman's whistle and his mother's excited screaming had interrupted Ignatius's dressing for the kickoff rally. He signed the postal delivery receipt and rushed back to his room, locking his door. 
He tore open the envelope and pulled out the letter. Sirs, did you really send me this telegram, Ignatius? Myrna, form Peace Party Central Committee Northeastern Zone at once. Stop. Organize at every level. Stop. Recruit sodomites only. Stop. Sex in politics. Stop. Details will follow. Stop. Ignatius, National Chairman. Stop. Please call collect any time after 6 p.m. I am very, very worried. M. Minkoff. Ignatius stood before the three-story stucco building regarding it with extreme distaste. His nose rebelled against the very noticeable odor of fresh enamel. His ears shrank from the bedlam of singing, cackling, and giggling that was going on behind the closed black patent leather shutters. He jabbed a finger into the bottom bell and waited. The frenzy behind the shutters abated very slightly. A door opened somewhere down the carriageway, and Dorian Green came walking toward the gate. Oh, dear, he said when he saw who was out on the sidewalk. Where in the world have you been? I'm afraid that the kickoff rally is really getting out of hand. Well, I hope you've done nothing to dampen the morale, Ignatius said gravely, tapping his cutlass impatiently on the iron gate. He noticed somewhat angrily that Dorian was walking toward him a little unsteadily. This was not what he had expected. Oh, what a gathering, Dorian said as he opened the gate. Everyone is simply letting their hair down. Inside, Ignatius saw a seething mass of people. Cigarettes and cocktail glasses held like batons flew in the air, directing the symphony of chatter, shrieking, singing, and laughing. From the bowels of a huge phonograph, the voice of Judy Garland was fighting its way through the din. Good gracious, Ignatius spluttered. I can see that we're going to have a great deal of trouble capturing the conservative rural redneck Calvinist vote. We're going to have to rebuild our image along lines other than those I see here. They entered the kitchen, where except for two young men who were having an emotional argument in a corner, all was quiet. Seated at a table were three women drinking from beer cans. They regarded Ignatius squarely. The one who was crushing a beer can in her hand stopped and tossed the can into a potted plant next to the sink. Girls, Dorian said. The three beer girls raised a raucous Bronx cheer. This is Ignatius Riley, a new face. Put her there, fats. The girl who had been crushing the can said she grabbed Ignatius's paw and worked it over as if it too were a prospect for crushing. Oh, my God, Ignatius screamed. That's Frida, Dorian explained, and they're Betty and Liz. Where did you pick him up? Frida asked Dorian while her two companions studied Ignatius and nudged each other. Mr. Green and I met through my mother, Ignatius answered grandly for Dorian. Well, grab yourself a beer, Tubby, Frida said. I wish we had it in bottles. Betty here could open you up one with her teeth. She's got teeth like an iron claw. Betty made an obscene gesture at Frida. And one of these days, she's going to get them all knocked down her fucking throat. You're asking for it, Frida said, raising one of the kitchen chairs. Well, I've had enough of this, Ignatius said angrily. I certainly am interested in seeing the first sherry party that the auxiliary gives. Ignatius snorted and lumbered to the door. Dorian followed him out and closed the door. I can't imagine how you decided to besmirch the movement by inviting those rowdies here. And he looked over the seething mass of guests. You must get these people quiet. We must bring them to order. There is crucial business at hand. Oh, dear, you're, you're serious about this, aren't you? Ignatius broke away from Dorian, rushed across the room, pushing through the elegant guests, and unplugged the phonograph. As he turned around, he was greeted by the guest's emasculated version of an Apache war cry. Silence! Ignatius bellowed over their enraged babbling. I am here tonight, my friends, to show you how you may save the world and bring peace. Will you turn your singular talents to saving the world, or will you simply turn your backs on your fellow man? The world today is in a state of grave unrest. Oh, what in heaven's name is he talking about? This is making me so depressed. Those eyes, they're frightening. Let's go to a smart bar. Let's go to San Francisco. Silence, you perverts, Ignatius cried. Listen to me. Oh, Dorian, get him out. An elegant guest shrieked in panic. This is an outrage. Ignatius was shouting, I have not only been ignored and vilified at this gathering, I have been viciously attacked within the walls of your cobweb of a home. I hope that you carry liability insurance. I had thought you might be different and funny, Dorian hissed at Ignatius. As it is, you proved me the most awful thing that has ever been in my house. Now get out. The door slammed, and the party seemed to have regained its momentum. The music had started again, 
and Ignatius heard the squealing and shrieking growing louder than before. He knocked on the black shutters with his cutlass, screaming, You will lose! A man, wearing a silk suit and a Hamburg, came out of the shadow of an adjoining doorway for a moment. Then the man slipped back into the darkness, watching Ignatius, who was waddling back and forth before the building furiously. Ignatius's valve responded to his emotions by plopping closed. His hands sympathized by sprouting a rich growth of tiny white bumps that itched maddeningly. What could he tell Myrna about the movement for peace now? Now, like the abortive crusade for Moorish dignity, he had another debacle on his itching hands. Perhaps it was still early enough to see the first show at the Night of Joy. What a lance Miss O'Hara would be to hurl right between Myrna's offensive eyes. Ignatius looked at the photograph once more, salivating slightly. What kind of pet? The evening could still be wrenched from the jaws of failure. As he crossed onto the Night of Joy's block, he heard the doped Negro calling, Woo! Come in and see Miss Harlow Horrell dancing with her pet, guaranteed 100% real plantation dancing. Ignatius saw him through the crowd that was hurrying past the Night of Joy. Apparently no one was heeding the Barker's plea. The Barker himself had paused in his calling to emit a nimbus formation of smoke. He was wearing tails and his dark glasses, smiling through the smoke at the people who resisted his appeals. Is, um, Miss O'Hara on yet? Ignatius slobbered at the Barker's elbow. Woo-wee! The fat mother had arrived in person. Hey, man, how come you're still wearing that earring and scarf? What are you supposed to be anyway? Please. Ignatius rattled his cutlass a bit. I haven't time to chat. I have no success pointers for you tonight, I'm afraid. Has Miss O'Hara begun? She'll be starting in a few minutes. You better get your ass in there and get you a ringside seat. I'll talk to the head waiter. He say he have a table all reserved for you. Jones propelled Ignatius rapidly through the padded door. Ignatius stumbled into the night of joy with such momentum that his smock swirled around his ankles. He looked about for the head waiter and saw none, so he lumbered through a few old men scattered about at tables in the gloom and seated himself at a small table directly beneath the stage. His cap looked like a solitary green footlight. At this close range, he could perhaps make some gesture to Miss O'Hara or whisper something about Bothius that would attract her attention. She would be overwhelmed when she realized there was a kindred spirit in the audience. Ignatius looked over at the bar to try to attract some sort of service and caught the eye of the bartender who had served his mother and him. The bartender pretended not to see him. Lana Lee appeared on the stage in what looked like gold lame overalls. Oh, my God! Ignatius spluttered. The dope negro had tricked him. In a moment, he was crouched down against the side of the stage. Over his head... The Nazi proprietress was saying, Welcome, ladies and genitals. It was so dreadful a beginning that Ignatius almost knocked over the table. And now, that pure virgin bell, Miss Harlot O'Hara. Then Darlene swept on stage in a ball gown that trailed yards of nylon net. On her head was a monstrous picture hat, and on her arm, a monstrous bird. Oh, my God! Ignatius bellowed, unable to remain silent any longer. Is this Cretan Harlot O'Hara? The cockatoo noticed him before Darlene did, for its beads of eyes had been focusing on Ignatius's hoop of a novelty earring ever since it had come on stage. When Ignatius bellowed, it flapped from Darlene's arm to the stage and squawking, hopping, dashed for Ignatius's head. As Ignatius was about to dash from the club, the bird hopped from the stage to his shoulder, sank its claws into his smock, and snagged his earring with its beak. Good heavens! Ignatius leaped up and beat at the bird with his itching paws. Come back here with my cockatoo! Darlene cried. Lana Lee was on the stage now screaming, How the hell did that character get in here? Lana Lee asked the confused septuagenarians in the audience, Where's Jones? Somebody get me Jones! Come here, you big crazy man! Darlene hollered. Good grief, Ignatius gasped, feeling for the door. In his wake, he had left a trail of overturned tables. How dare you fiends inflict a rabid bird upon your unsuspecting customers? You may expect to be sued in the morning. 
Ignatius knocked over another table as he and the cockatoo lurched forward. Then he felt the earring loosening, and the cockatoo, the earring firmly in its beak, fell from his shoulder. Terrorized, Ignatius bounced out of the door. Ignatius stumbled past Jones, who had never expected the sabotage to assume such dramatic proportions. Gasping, clutching his cemented valve, Ignatius continued forward onto the street and into the path of an oncoming desire bus. The headlights swam and faded from his sight as he fainted. He would have fallen directly before the bus if Jones hadn't leaped into the street and pulled at the white smock with his two large hands. Ignatius instead fell backward, and the bus, exhaling diesel exhaust, rumbled past an inch or two from his desert boots. Is he dead? Lana Lee asked hopefully, studying the mound of white material lying in the street. Hey, wake up, man, Jones said, blowing some smoke over the inert figure. The man in the silk suit in Hamburg stepped from an alleyway, where he had hidden himself when he saw Ignatius enter the night of joy. Let me take a look at him, the man in the Hamburg said, bending over and listening to Ignatius's heart. A kettle drum of a thump told him that life still breathed within the yards of the white smock. He's okay. He just passed out. The man cleared his throat and ordered weakly, Everybody back. Give him air. Through the darkness of his glasses, Jones looked at the stranger. He looked familiar, like a well-dressed version of someone Jones had seen before. The weak eyes were most familiar. Jones remembered the same weak eyes on top of a red beard. He said nothing. A policeman was a policeman. It was always best to ignore them unless they bothered you. Lana Lee was about to go over and kick the mound into consciousness and get it out of her gutter when the man in the Hamburg said politely, I'd like to use your telephone. Maybe I'd better call an ambulance. Sure, sure, she whispered. Now, now, look, you don't want to waste your evening messing with that character laying in the street. He's some kind of bum. You look like you could use some fun. She stepped around the white smock, which was wheezing and snorting volcanically. Somewhere in fantasy land, Ignatius was dreaming of a terrified Myrna Minkoff being tried by a court of taste and decency. A dreadful sentence was about to be pronounced. Something guaranteeing physical injury to her person as penance of innumerable offenses. Lana Lee got close to the man and reached into her gold lame overalls. She squatted next to him and flashed the Boethian photograph cupped in her hand. <laughs> Take a look at this baby. How'd you like to spend the evening with that? The man in the Hamburg turned his eyes from Ignatius's whitened face and looked at the woman, the book, the globe, the chalk. He cleared his throat once more and said, I'm Patrolman Mancuso, undercover agent. You're under arrest for soliciting and for possession of pornography. End of Side 3